So, uh, so the panel is about smart contract security. Uh, and one thing that's uh, been talked about a lot recently is uh, formal verification. So uh, if we start off with that, do you think that formal verification is going to be a new tool in the like developer tool chain that's going to be commonly used when developing smart contracts? What's your take? Phil? All right, so uh, I worked in formal verification for almost four years before I joined IC3 at Cornell. And uh, I think formal verification is really in the broader community finally getting to that point where it's reaching acceptance and the tools are reaching the level of maturity that makes them actually practical. Um, so yeah, I think formal verification is really going to be um, one critical piece of the overall security picture. Uh, like I said in my talk yesterday, it's really not a silver bullet, um, but I'm really looking forward to using Ethereum and the smart contract space to set the standard for how formal verification should be done in the broader software development industry and even in the safety critical domain. So I think we have a big opportunity here. Um, to show people how it's done, really. So, and do you think that, uh, so it's not only going to be for the, the specialized contracts, but more for, in general, people are going to do formal verification. Is that going to be the, the developers moving over into the formal verification domain, or are we going to have tools which make it more easy to formally verify your, your contracts? Uh, I think we're going to have a little bit of both, and I think it's up to the users of these contracts to really demand the standard and the level of rigor that's appropriate for the amount of money that's going into them. I think uh, having low effort automated tools is really a great goal and is something that I would personally even like to contribute to in this space. And I think that will be great for many, many contracts. But when you have really, really high value contracts, I think we will need to have some sort of specialized approach where we bring in experts and we, we ask the questions about what is this contract actually doing and how can we make sure it's doing what we think it's doing. So yeah, I think to answer the question, it'll be a combination of both general, automatic, and specialized approaches. And it really depends on how much money your contract is handling and what the attack surface is and other factors like that. And I would add to that that the tooling is going to be a critical component because a lot of the developers that are coming in and developing contracts are coming from the app development space. So if you're building web apps or mobile apps, you're not used to these kinds of requirements. And um, truly, smart contract development is much more similar to writing software to put a shuttle into space or writing software for um, safety medical devices. Uh, you're writing software that handles millions of dollars potentially. So the kinds of security requirements are closer to those applications. And a lot of the DAP developers are not coming from that space. So a combination of tooling that automates a lot of the formal verification and then also education just as a process to bring developers up to speed with here's the domain we're in and here's really what the requirements are uh, to produce production apps. Yeah, and I think a lot of that is going to come from the user side as well. We really need to educate users and make them demand the appropriate level of rigor for um, the software that they're using. Uh, I know people are putting lots of money in contracts right now that don't even have tests, and that's like really the bare minimum in terms of software engineering. So um, until we educate people to sort of what's possible and what the tools um, exist to do, um, I don't think we'll see much improvement. So there definitely needs to be a push on both the developer and the user side in terms of these tools. It's not just a matter of educating users. I think the other thing that we can and should be targeting is like user facing intermediaries. So like one, I think, um, yeah, it's on. One, two, three, four. <laughs> can we formally verify these microphones next time? I have six, seven, eight. <laughs> Nine. <laughs> so, what I was saying is that I think it's not just users that we should be targeting here. I think it's also user facing intermediaries. So like one good thing from that standpoint that has already happened is just the fact that block explorers like Etherscan have source code verification. So we can now check if you see a contract that you might be considering interacting with, you can actually go to one of these sites and you can check the source code and they verify the source code actually matches the bytecode. So we can see something like that potentially. You can see something like that potentially being expanded quite a bit, you know, including sort of, you know, check marks for like what kinds of form of verification guarantees it's, pa it's passed, are there any tests that it's passed, are there any tests that it's failed, and so forth. So, um, I know, Rain, you've been developing some tooling for Solidity, and um, 
So when we're talking about tools, what kind of more tools uh, are needed in this space? Well, there's a huge range, and um, I think it's useful to have both the tools that are offering rigorous uh, methods of completeness, and the academic work and the research is really essential to that. Um, but you can get a lot of value out of heuristics as well, and um, you know things that are rather obvious now, like the reentry attack on the DAO. Uh, maybe the particulars of it weren't obvious to spot, but the the particular attack of having a recursive call. Uh, from an external call is, is quite easy to spot, and so it doesn't take um, a very heavy-duty approach to be able to d detect those things. So uh, the tooling can range from the more rigorous to um, just some simple uh, sorts of analyses. Static analysis is a great tool to be able to just detect uh, things that are potential areas of risk. Um, and so I think that can go a long way towards uh, providing people more visibility into contracts. Uh, and if you know that you're looking for risks, then uh, we can devise tools that highlight that and um, expose where the potential areas are. And that can be a low, that can be low investment. You know, you don't have to do a full security audit uh, first, as a first step, you'll want to do it later, but as a first step, if you can run some tools that provide um, some indications of where to look for uh, security vulnerabilities, that offers a lot of value for a low cost. And, and I think that stuff should be in the compiler. Like in most uh, high level languages, you have that kind of basic static analysis already built into the compiler. And there's no reason we shouldn't be doing the same here. Um, the only caution that I would have is uh, being careful not to just run sort of all the low effort tools and then call it a, a solved problem and put a bunch of money in the contract because that's something that happens uh, inside of the, the corporate space and even in high assurance software all the time where people will run a few tools and then assume that they have assurance that really isn't there, so. So when we talk about smart contract security, often you talk about only from the developer perspective, uh, but, and it's easy to forget that there's also a user perspective. So what, what, how can we make it more secure for end users to interact with contracts, uh, which may or may not be hostile or backdoored or flawed? I think in, in that there's always going to be like a few different pieces of the puzzle. So like earlier on, I mean, I, I had mentioned block explorers. One other possibility is that figure out some ki what kind of tools or what kind of things should be integrated into something like Mist. Um, then of course there's a the question of exactly what kinds of things do get integrated. So, but if it's formal verification checkers, then like one question is what exactly are you verifying? Because it's easy to write a contract where, with a mo if, you have, if you're a malicious developer, you write the contract, and you also just like write a bunch of weird Y3 statements, and it looks impressive and looks secure. But in reality, the Y3 statements are like missing something that's actually a backdoor. So there's like that's part of it, but the uh, the other part is even just things like security auditing, and even saying you know the, this particular contract has been audited by like these particular people. This particular contract matches some particular template. Yeah, I think this is, this is fundamentally a UX problem and we should take inspiration from the work that's been done in browsers. There's been a lot of work about how to securely browse websites and there are a lot of parallels between that and dApps. Well, I think uh, the security model that we have here or that we're trying to achieve is definitely a bit stricter because we're saying that it's the job of MIST to even to protect the user from number one, bad contracts, number two, bad interfaces to good contracts. We don't even trust the source of the JavaScript necessarily. And, um, and then, you know, if you have good contracts and you, and you have good JavaScript, on top of that, there's also built-in user access control, which is, you know, something that we can have a panel on all by itself. So if you make the comparison to, to for example, the, the web and you browse the internet with, with Google Chrome, you have, uh, they have a blacklist approach where, they, where you try to access something which is known bad and they alert you. Uh, so do you see that as a, as a possible way forward or more reputation about uh, reputation systems for known good contracts and, and services? I mean, as far as reputation systems go, reputation systems go like the two sort of flow into each other. Like a blacklist is a reputation system where the default is zero and can go negative, and the other one is where the default is zero and can go positive. And I think both approaches have their merits. So for 
example, I, I think there are uh, there are some kinds of white whitelists that do that, that do make sense. So, for example, if you are accessing some particular application, and then the application all of a sudden decides to like force your accounts to call to do a call to some completely unknown address with a large amount of gas and a large amount of data, you might want to make sure be concerned that maybe that call is like actually stealing all of your maker coins or something similar. And so like an approach that explicitly asks for your permission if it's outside of some white whitelist might be a good way of mitigating that. Meanwhile, if there is some like known blacklist, then that's something that um, you could pr provide like e even stronger warnings about. So it's, uh, it depends on what it is that you're blocking and it also depends on sort of what the consequences are of you know, something being outside of the whitelist or inside the blacklist. And I do think that the web access control on the web is a good um, good comparison from a UI perspective. And uh, the industry's had to deal with how do you communicate to users that this is a risk, but a particular type of risk. So the same way that you would download an app and they would ask permission to use a camera. Um, you know, if you flood the user with too many of those warnings, you just entrain them to click OK. Um, and uh, But if you don't provide the correct access control, uh, for the for the correct types of operations, then um, then the security is worse. So I think we do at least from a UI perspective, we have a kind of comparison and like how do you create something for the user that is both simple and um, provides those the the robust robust security measures against things like sending lots of ether or whatever. I think there's also an opportunity for some of the uh, existing early uh, DApp development companies in this space to set a standard. So like one thing that we don't want, for example, is a situation where it's just like an accepted default to like ask for every single permission under the sun. Because once you do that, then you just like re remove the value of the system in the first place. But if, on the other hand, you know, a lot of applications are designed in such a way that they do sort of flow nicely with the ac with uh, the security and access control that exists, then something that doesn't uh, sort of fit those patterns would be would actually sort of get looked at much more suspiciously, which is what we would. Um, I'm going to ask a, a direct question. So, in the as of today, with the languages we have, if you want to write secure contracts, is it possible to, to develop a secure contract without knowing pretty much in depth how the VM works uh, underneath the language level, the quirks? Nothing of any complexity, I'd say. I mean, if you have something very simple that's following an established pattern, sure. But if you're going into some new space, then yeah, you should understand how the internals affect your contract or have someone look at it who does. I mean, ideally, uh, I think we'd want to reach the, reach the stage where like the language is intuitive and like the limitations in the VM layer don't really uh, like cause, cause any quirks that are sort of unexpected that don't appear at the, at the solidity level itself, but at the same time, we're not quite there yet. So like we have thing, you know, we have things to worry about like gas, we have call stack limits, so we, have, we have stack limits. So there are a couple of ways of attacking the problem. So one of them is modifying the protocol to try and reduce the number of those limits. So like I have an EIP out there that basically gets rid of the call stack limit and basically replaces it with like a gas-based limitation scheme. Another thing is to, basically just like put more checks into the development environment. So if, for example, you have code where you can't, like let's say formally verify that it consumes like less than some safe, safe amount of gas and that's something that it should be looked at more closely. And look, those are things where we can't have tools, to, where we can't have tools to highlight. So I'm gonna draw an uh, analogy to safety critical systems here where if you really wanna build something that's going in a spacecraft or something like that, you still have to consider the hardware and you still have to consider the assembly representation and you really have to consider at least the whole stack. So I don't think you'll, I, I, I think maybe eventually once we really develop these tools, you'll be able to have some sort of ignorance and abstraction of those lower levels, but I, I think it's gonna be years personally. Do you think that uh, development on new uh, domain specific languages for certain types of contracts or contracts in general would aid? Do you think that's coming, that we're having more languages? Because earlier we had, there was development both in Solidity and Serpent and for that part LLL. Now it seems that Solidity is the leading the race and is almost the canonical contract development language. Will there be more? 
Well, I can speak from my perspective that I, I hope there will be more because the language, a language like Solidity that's fairly high level is our main abstraction layer over the EVM. So as developers, um, we spend more time writing smart contracts in that, that abstraction layer and so to the extent that the abstraction layer, layer supports good security practices, that's going to help the whole community write more secure contracts. And um, right now, I think that the, the convergence on Solidity is helpful to create stability in the community, but we really do need other languages and other abstraction layers, um, not to necessarily find the ultimate one, but to, um, similar to the, to the web community, to have more experimentation and have the ecosystem naturally evolve these different abstraction layers. Um, so yeah, I personally, I would love to see other languages and um, you know the EVMC and JIT work that we heard about yesterday is really exciting in order to open up that the, the platform. So I'm gonna play a little bit of devil's advocate on this. I don't think good languages can solve bad programmers and I think that as long as you're having a Turing complete language that has expressiveness, you're gonna run into problems of some sort with the language um, and I do, think that having a small number of diverse languages is better than having a very large number of languages because then you have more people in the community who can understand the language really well and sort of audit your code. Um, so for, for the web, it's a great example. Um, you mostly see JavaScript really in practice for client-side computation. And uh, even though it's not the greatest language, um, people do understand it and they sort of understand the common anti-patterns and that helps them write secure code in many cases. To use your own example, however, uh, the transpilers that have taken off in the last five to 10 years in the JavaScript community have allowed the community to test ES6, ES7 features before they're part of the core. So that's like this bottom-up um, contribution to the language and evolution. So it's not just the TC39 committee that is bringing the language changes from the top down. They're certainly helping to add them to the language, but there's this bottom-up effort from community members and transpilers, and so it, it just helps inform it from both sides. So I would agree with you that um, having the kind of core language offerings and uh, having people develop expertise in that language is, is the primary concern, but then if you take a step back and look at the ecosystem as a whole and the evolution of the patterns and abstractions and languages that are available, having uh, multiple sources of experimentation and um, evolution I think really helps. Totally agree. All right, so it's time for one last question. <coughs> Do you think there are any particular uh, features of the EVM or new opcodes or, or changes to the M EVM which could be made which could improve the security in contracts? Uh, one thing that I really don't like about the EVM is the lack of distinction between um, calling a function, sending money, um, and sending a message. I think there should be some ways to access more restrictive subsets of this functionality where maybe you only want to send money and um, allow other contracts that you're sending money to to perform only limited operations, um, otherwise fail. So I think maybe that, that architect architectural concern could use some work, but in general, I, I don't think so. I think there's a lot more work to be done at the higher levels than at the EVM right now. I have a few specific proposals for like one of them is the co is uh, as I mentioned replacing the cost the cost replacing the cost stack limit with with gas one of them is the uh, uh, call static proposal where you can make a call so that which can like read as much as it needs to but not make any state changes and a few others and you know I think like those can make good building blocks like, and uh, there are like different creative ways that high level languages can start using them but uh, in general, like the impression I've gotten is that it's much more about these sort of incremental additions than you know, sort of fairly substantial redesigns. All right, I think we're running out of time. Is that right, Ming? Yeah. So, thank you guys. Thank you.